good morning everyone and a hearty welcome to one and all compassion knows no religion character knows no caste and love knows no gender love between same sex is no more abnormal than being left handed sexual orientation is natural and people have no control over it for the simple reason that a homosexual is not made he is born and no community however small it may be can be deprived of its sexual rights and expressions for otherwise it will destroy its identity and dignity even our supreme court in its historic 2017 judgment has ruled that every individual has a fundamental right to privacy which is a part of life and sex is undoubtedly private and the lgbt community is no exception to this rule now though the rights of the lgbt group are real and founded on constitutional doctrine yet they are denied the right to marry a person of their own sex and they face so many hurdles in issues relating to housing employment including military service healthcare sports politics and in practically every walk of life dear friends today we have with us a learned scholar professor abhijit rohi from from maharashtra national university mumbai he is going to take us through the entire gamut of the lgbt issue and we have to see whether the quest for acceptance is complete or it still needs to be continued i welcome all the participants and professor rohi to this very interesting and to this very interesting talk good morning and once again a hearty welcome this webinar and especially uh, dr chandira mari who is principal of this uh, college for giving me this opportunity and constantly being in touch with me to you know make sure that this happens so uh, thank you thank you so much uh, i am going to like kind of uh, change uh, a mat approach that i am going to take is probably there are going to be certain instances which i will give some of these instances are what i would ask you to imagine and probably through this process of imagination that we would be able to understand what it is uh, to be a gay person in uh, india and of course i'm sure for most of us it's not going to be easy because that's not something the lived reality of most of our lives are but nonetheless let's make an attempt because that's probably the power of imagination would let us uh, understand all of this but again before i do that as well i have to give a basic disclaimer which is about uh, the fact that not many people would be Uh, comfortable in discussing or probably hear discussion about this because none of us have been in the school have ever spoken about sex education or issues related to sex and then sex is a taboo in indian society anyway uh, so i do not wish to under any circumstances uh, you know disrespect your religious uh, ideas your religious uh, political ideas so if anything comes across as if i am you know disrespecting that please excuse me but nonetheless i am making an effort to discuss all of these things in a purely academic spirit so i hope that you uh, would be able to understand what i um, am trying to communicate now let let's let's take the one simple uh, example here imagine that now you are a child you go to school you play with your friends everything that you do seems to not match with what others are doing or what others are expecting you to do so you hear them comment they call you names they criticize you they make fun of you some of them even bully you about everything that you do the way you talk the way you walk the way you play the things that you like and so much more so you wish to complain about it uh, you go to teachers but uh, the teachers also share the same opinion as that of others and so the teachers try to tell you to mend your ways of behaving uh, you think maybe parents may lend you the comforting ear but even your parents also expect you to work on yourself by pointing out exactly the same things that you need to change uh, those were the exact same things that your peers have made fun of and then now you feel that you know no one understands you and then that they they all think that what you are doing is actually wrong mm -hmm. you feel lonelier 
all of these incidences have reinforced the idea among the bullies that what they did was in fact nothing wrong and their bullying then also intensifies now you fear the bullies and uh, you know uh, since you can't talk about it to anyone you feel even secluded neglected and sometimes even worthless now over a period of time you feel that you know they may be right and there must be something definitely wrong with you uh, so what you do is you believe this narrative of theirs and then you start questioning yourself and you don't know even like because you can't talk, talk about it to anyone you don't even know how to deal with this situation so you make desperate attempts to fit in and be like everyone else and in the entire process you know you are scarred for your life now that's the situation that probably gives you the early life stages of a homosexual person so to say and uh, something that we have to understand which i will talk about of course subsequently later in 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 this talk is that uh, you know this is just what it is i mean it's not something that i have chosen for myself or you have chosen for yourself we just are the way we are like you know you did not choose to be straight or you did not choose to be gay so did i not cho choose to be straight or gay whatever the case may be so that's something which is an underlying factor now then let's If with this kind of uh, imaginary situation why did i then take up this topic and why have i put the title as same sex love and not same sex relationships and the quest for acceptance i will give you few reasons for doing that first and foremost i have to talk about why did i call it like same sex love and not anything else like same sex couples same sex relationships or anything of that sort is primarily the fact that we all think that homosexuality or alternate sexualities than the heterosexuality are all you know just about sex but we have to understand it's not about sex at all there are feelings there are emotions which are involved in the entire process and then it's it's primarily the question that we always come about as to who do we consider our companion and then how does our companion would essentially look like so if you are a straight boy you would essentially consider a girl as your companion but if you are a gay person you would consider uh, the person of the same uh sex is yours to be uh, your companion and then it's actually psychological emotional and uh, you know when when your feelings are in fact to that extent involved and that's why the word love is been included second part is why am i talking about acceptance and not anything else like tolerance or something of that sort but that's where i have to tell you that tolerance is just uh you know a simple step that you know you tolerate things you need not agree you need not respect you just like you know let things as they are so you abstain from engaging with that kind of uh you know behavior so tolerance is just okay fine like i tolerate you i do not want to do anything with you but you know you are free to do whatever you want to do but acceptance goes a step further it actually is engaging yourself actively with the people who are then identifying themselves as homosexuals and that's something which is uh, you know an important part that we have to talk about so when we talk about acceptance we do not want indian society to only like let's say tolerate you know uh, sexual minorities rather we want indian society to accept them as the you know parts of indian society per se and that's the reason why again it's the quest for acceptance and not anything else now when i say acceptance i have to again talk about a few things there the first part is that you know who are we talking about this acceptance from and when it comes to people from alternate sexualities or additional sexualities uh, it's primarily acceptance by society by family and by themselves now and again keep in mind this order that i have made like you know acceptance first by the society second by the family and third by the self is a very very deliberate choice on my part now why did i you know make this as a choice now here again i would take you to imagine a situation when you are in your teenage years imagine that you are a boy in your teenage years you have reached your puberty and so have your classmates they all have started to talk uh, make comments about girls and fancying them and you seem to have no such feelings of that sort you don't fancy girls at all rather you have attraction to a boy in your class but you can't speak about it even in uh, even like the worst case situation would be act ever on your intentions because you know you have been constantly told that a love can happen between only a boy and a girl 
right? And that's essentially how the heterosexual society kind of views it. So everybody around you also confirms this uh, thought of, uh, you know, yours through their behavior. So let's take the simple example where, you know, uh, you then go ahead and question yourself, your choices and your preferences. So you go and attend your family functions, you go attend like some religious ceremonies from your family or marriages of your relatives, you go watch movies, you watch, you read books, and then every interaction, social interaction that you have with other people is primarily, you know, reinforcing the notion that you are supposed to, as a boy, love a girl. And then all of these societal ideas essentially fuel this feeling that what you are doing is essentially wrong. Now, you can't talk about, of course, all of this because there is no safe space, so to say, in a society which is predominantly uh, values heteronormativity or predominantly heterosexuality. So you can't talk about it. So again, you feel extremely lonely, secluded as an outsider, and then you always feel that you do not belong here. And then you ask yourself, what the hell did I do wrong? And then, like, you know, sometimes if you are religious, you pray uh, for these feelings to go away every day. But sadly, you know, like even God seems to be occupied with the problems of others and then so no help for you. But you feel helpless in every second of every day all through your life. And I just can not tell you as to how one can imagine this unless or until one has lived this reality. But try and make as much attempt to, you know, probably imagine that, you know, you feel helpless every second of every day throughout your life in your own skin. And then you feel that you are wrong, that you are abnormal, that, uh, you know, uh, you are an outsider and you can't express yourself at all. So you are pushed into your shell and then, you know, you just try to confine yourself from the uh, vastness of the society. You feel like you have no one else to blame but yourself. So you feel excessively confined then and forced to be well within your framework and that you can't even breathe. And then your life, as you would consider it, would actually be an embodiment of living hell. And then you think, how would I put an end to all of this? And then when all of these thoughts are going on in your mind, you have to understand that your self-acceptance is heavily dependent on society's perceptions about things, right? Mm. And if the society then thinks that this is something which is not right, then it becomes very difficult even for you to accept yourself. And it's an intermediary stage in between society and yourself is your family. Because family is torn between the love for you, hopefully, and uh, you know the love for the rest of the society. Because at the end of the day, we are in an Indian society which is collectivist. And uh, so to say, to a larger extent, we in fact believe that society is more important. And that's why, you know, like a very interesting a uh, phrase that you would constantly probably would come across that Lokya Kahenge has killed more dreams in Indian society than anything else put together. But uh, you might as well be able to see the reality there and then your family is torn between this very idea as to what the people and society would say. And then you have to understand, like I said, that when you are in such situation where you feel so damn frustrated as to what should I do now and what is the way out, certain extreme steps are usually taken by, you know, youths in LGBT community. And I'm not talking primarily here about, again, the transgender or transsexual community. I'm largely focusing, again, only on same-sex couples, which probably would involve is, you know, lesbians, gays, and bisexuals who would otherwise fancy being with the people of the same sex. So LGBT youth, you know, they seriously contemplate committing suicide at least three times the rate that of any heterosexual youth. And this is a research, if you could probably visit the page by Tra Travel Project, which is uh, an organization working for LGBT community in the United States. They have conducted an empirical study, and this does in fact confirm that. It also concluded that almost, uh, you know, uh, the gay kids are almost five times likely to have attempted suicides compared to heterosexual youth. And then you see the severity of it. But at the same time, we have to understand that when we're talking about sexual minorities, your Supreme Court once in history had said that uh, heterosexuality 
uh, I mean, uh, is is the basic norm, and homosexuals are very very uh, minor, and they are minuscule minority in the society. So to, and that's the reason why probably we shouldn't be bothered as much about what happens in their lives. But that's something which is inherently wrong. And 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 when I come from a human rights uh, background, and I kind of find it absolutely appalling to kind of even have such kind of an argument. But nonetheless, we have had this kind of uh, you know contention before, which then said that if you are a minority, it doesn't matter. But again, the research, which is an empirical study conducted, primarily have indicated that almost seven to eight persons out of every hundred persons is actually going to be a person belonging to the sexual minority. And when I say sexual minority, then I'm talking about the entire spectrum of uh, lesbians, gays, transgenders, uh, queers, uh, and everybody. So, why, when we say all of these things are happening, why is this self-acceptance not coming into picture? So again, look at it from this point. So society stays at the outside of your door, but then it interferes in your life by way of your family, your parents, your siblings, and everybody else. You yourself are inherently conflicted because at the same time you have these internal feelings, but uh, you cannot accept those feelings because everyone around you and everything around you indicates that you know what your feelings are are inherently wrong. And then we come to another problem, which is the love for our parents. So you as a gay child would of course love your parents like everybody does. So when we have uh, the love for our parents, and here I'm of course using love in very, very platonic sense of the term and not in the title of this uh, talk term. So in this context, we have to understand that even our parents have expectations of us, right? So everybody around us also has certain expectations from us. So parents expect certain things, friends ex uh, expect certain things, peers of yours expect, even if they're your friends or not. And society also expects certain things out of you. And all of these expectations are extremely centered around heterosexuality. And then you feel again, like, you know, that you are an outsider. And that's a very, very important factor. And you do not want your parents to be disappointed in you. You do not want to create hardships for your parents. So you do not want to talk about any of these issues with your parents as well, because they might uh, kind of uh, face a lot of problems because of this. That's the first part. The second part, which is again, acts as a problem in like, you know, self-acceptance is the very idea of love, the romantic relationships and everything associated with it in the society is again dominated by heteronormativity, where heterosexual relationships are the established norm and accepted as normal behavior. And everything else other than that is viewed as not normal. And then, you know, to a larger extent, abnormal. And it is tabooed and it is not to be let out in the society. And never have you ever from your childhood been ever exposed to the idea that you know you are supposed to speak about or you are exposed to certain alternate forms of uh, relationships and then your ideas of love themselves conflict with what you feel inside and that's again a problem and thirdly even when let's say you have grown you have tried to deal with all of this situation now you are professionally engaged into certain you know institutions organizations companies wherever that you are working at they might have their own culture and that culture sometimes accept or sometimes absolutely reject or detest this every, uh, you know, kind of uh, behavior. So it affects, of course, your ability to express yourself professionally. It affects the possibility of your expression. It affects the space of your expression. And then you always are living under the fear of being judged. And so in, in all of these cases, every time this squarely affects your ability to believe in yourself, it affects your self-confidence, it then affects your performance, and it subsequently affects your efficiency, even at professional and at personal level. And then you see how the problems are multiple and layered. And one thing gives rise to another thing, and that's something which is, uh, you know, a big problem in terms of addressing the issues of acceptance about uh, LGB community. Now, while we're talking about these problems, why are these problems then existent should be the second question that essentially comes about. So let me tell you some of the aspects about why these problems are problems. 
the first one and the most rampant of it all is deep rooted ignorance and this ignorance flows from n number of things right i will talk about this ignorance also in a bit while but nonetheless the first problem is ignorance second problem is social pressure for everybody to fit in and any deviation from accepted social norm is viewed as uh, is is usually looked down upon is considered absolutely abnormal is considered even immoral or sinful or it is considered a, an and and perversion and uh, it also can essentially be resulting into a situation where when your legal systems are based on how society perceives certain things you might as well be one of those people who would be labeled as criminal right so i mean i will give an example here as to how this criminality angle plays an important role now at least since 2017 onwards as uh, was pointed out before that homosexual relationships per se are not uh, you know uh, considered illegal or they are not criminalized anymore but they have been criminalized till 2017 right and what happens again in this entire process is that when you know that the law also gives it as a crime then again that reinforces the notion that what you feel is inherently wrong right and another factor that does come about is the basic example that you would see is like beggary so initially we had even beggars uh, and prostitutes they were considered as criminals but then nobody willingly enters into the you know beggary as a profession or prostitution as a profession uh, but nonetheless people are there and then they get labeled as criminals and punished for all what their not their faults are and then you kind of see as to how social ignorance transpires into the legal systems per se and then what happens on top of it all to further problem uh, create the problems and problematize the entire situation for lgbt community is is the systemic heteronormativity which again very very systematically suppresses any form of queerness right so let's let's take the basic examples where everything is determined beforehand i will talk about this again in a bit while but i will just give one example here i mean something which is as neutral so to say as colors are gendered so oh, if i am a kid and i like pink then oh probably that you know like i might be gay or like you know whatever and i am a boy and i am supposed to like to not play with barbies and i am supposed to like to play with only cars and everything so you imagine as to how this systemic heteronormativity from your childhood to whatever that you grow essentially surrounds you and then you don't feel like they you know whatever that you feel inside is matching with what is there outside and when this system reinforces the very notion that you know only accepted relationships are hetero normative ones then everything which is otherwise is subjected to hate crimes is subjected to severe intolerant reactions from the society is mocked by the society and sometimes it results in severely undermining the value of human life itself i mean at the end of the day what are we you know what human societies are supposed to do is to protect human life but if our society is designed in a way where we suppress some human identities and undervalue some human life then i think we have to rethink as to what we have been believing for all this while now now that you understand the gamut of the problem how do we kind of like i solve about this so we have the courses in law schools which we run for the entire semester where we just discuss gender sex sexuality and law and then how law intersects with all of these and then there are many many philosophical theoretical uh, frameworks within which all of this would happen and of course i'm not going to go into the details of that probably some other time we can think about it but as of now we have to understand that this framework which is created by these sexuality studies gender studies and everything of that sort probably will help us understand certain things let's look at the concept of ignorance that we discussed before that society largely is ignorant this ignorance is not necessarily always unintentional right of course there are going to be situations where it is unintentional but in some many of the cases it is also willful ignorance in the sense you know that there are gay people in the society but you choose to willingly ignore or recognize that fact right and this kind of an ignorance the willful ignorance is much bigger a problem than an unintentional ignorance unintentional ignorance is probably ignorance of fact and 
even in law we consider that as an excusable uh, thing but a willful ignorance is probably something which is not allowed how do we make that that everybody knows what the things are is usually rendering courses on sex education and everything of that sort this lecture of mine is to be considered as as one of the attempts of you know probably of making you aware about what things are and after this lecture i would surely hope that you know you would try to mend your ways and perceptions of how you look at society if even one person can do that i think uh, the women's development center of the college would actually be happy anyway the second part that we have to look at is there is this constant conflict between what scientific perspectives are telling you and what social perspectives are now let's look at it from this point of view it was like early 1960s 70s where american psychiatric association has essentially said that homosexuality is no longer a disease it's not the deviation it's not an abnormality it cannot be treated it's a natural occurrence other scientific uh, studies which are empirical studies of other species of animals essentially concluded that homosexuality is found in like more than 1000 species, uh, species and then it's something which is uh, inherently acceptable in all of those species then we have to consider then if homosexuality is normal in species why is homophobia only limited to human species because i don't think that other animals you know hate or kill these people but only i guess human beings end up doing that and so is the reason why you see that homophobia is a problem and not homosexuality right but your society tells you that homophobia is an accepted norm whereas homosexuality is a disease and you will have to then figure out as to how do we kind of like bridge this scientific perspectives versus social perspectives and this conflict is way wider i mean uh, just to tell you legally speaking our constitution fundamental you know, duties article 51a essentially say that we have a fundamental duty to accept scientific approach to life mm-hmm. but somewhere down the line we are forgetting our fundamental duties and then the second part which comes in is like what do we value in our lives so much i mean we have seen people killing each other in the name of religion in the name of god in the name of like no i don't know some some very very abstract notions but we fail to realize and identify and associate inherent value of dignity autonomy and equality to human life and that's the basic human rights perspective that i would be advocating for in the sense that you have to value human beings for who they are right and then i would again invoke gandhi in the entire sphere where gandhi said hate the sin and not the sinner right but again this is a problematic analogy because again what is sin is very very society oriented and not necessarily based on the scientific understandings so again you run in the problems there but nonetheless the basic point that i am trying to communicate is that you have to respect autonomy of every individual an ability to self introspect ability to self develop and achieve the development one desires respect the dignity and ensure that there is equality for everyone and then uh, when we talk about all these notions that you know like sex gender and sexuality i want to talk about each of these in nutshells it's because they are intrinsically related to the entire debate of uh, the lgbt communities lives so when we talk about sex we essentially mean anatomical or physical features right so based on the fact of what my biological organs are the moment i am born i am assigned a sex on my birth certificate which is usually the biological sex with which i am born right and that's an assigned sex uh, usually there are only three kinds there like to large, largely speaking male female and intersex now again try and uh, understand that male and female are the ones which are broadly accepted norms because again we are very very binary so to say we think in terms of like zeros and ones so either you are male or female intersex so to say just does not exist but scientifically speaking uh, you know intersex is going to be a person whose sexual and reproductive autonomy doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of female and male so you might have the male genitalia but then you internally might also have certain organs which might uh, be resembling to female uh, you know a reproductive system and that is a natural existence the sex chromosomes is one of the scientific ways of determining what the person would essentially be whether male female or an intersex and then uh, you know you have to understand that when i am um, 
looking at sex, the newer concept which comes in is sex reassignment surgeries, right? So what are sex reassignment surgeries is where I am born as a man, but I don't feel like a man at all. I associate myself as a woman, which is very, very gendered notion. And I want my body and my body doesn't match with my mind, right? So my body, when it doesn't match with the mind, I want to change my body. And the process of doing that is sex, uh, sex reassignment surgeries, where I transfer my, I mean, I change my sex from male to female or female to male, whatever the case might be. And all of these are scientifically possible. That's the first part, the entire domain of sex. Then you have the concept of gender. And when we talk about gender, we have to understand gender is nothing but a social construct, right? So every society kind of dictates as to what, uh, you know, norms are accepted, what roles are and how relationships are. And all of them are extremely gendered. Right. So uh, it is about like how men and women are expected to behave, are expected to dress or communicate or, you know, like contribute to this very notion of how genders are perceived. Then you have the second aspect, which is social acceptance and non-acceptance of these constructs. Right. And that's where we have to understand that, you know, we have gendered almost everything in our life. Right length of the hair has also been gendered so if you are a girl you're supposed to have like long hair if you are a guy usually you're not supposed to do that of course fashion changes that brings in twists but then not everybody again accepts it wearing high heels like i mean girls can wear as high heels as they want but then if the boys do it it's not acceptable then even in a very traditional indian context wearing nose rings i mean nose rings is primarily worn as an ornament by women but men are not supposed to wear them. So every aspect of our life, including how we dress and everything of that sort, have primarily been gendered, so to say. And then um, these evolve societal norms and then they determine the roles. So if you are a mother, your job is to primarily bear the children and uh, rear the children, right? And father is inadvertently, who is a male gender, is expected to be the earning member of the family who should go out earn and you know bring money home so that's the gendered understandings of the roles as well and that's the reason why our families also look the way they look in the sense that you have a father you have a mother each of them have their own identified roles and then they act according to that established social norms of the roles but um, there are two interesting concepts which appear there one is gender identity and another one is gender expression so when we're talking about gender identity is when is, is about how you feel inside, right? So it's one's internal personal sense of either being a man or a woman. And then you have to understand for transgender people, they are called transgender because their internal gender identity does not match with the sex that they are assigned at birth, right? And that's the gender identity. So you probably would have to again understand the difference between transsexuals and transgenders here. And here I'm talking about gender identity and transgenders are the people whose internal gender identity does not match the sex that they are assigned. And then there is another way that is gender expression is how you express your gender, right? So this part essentially implies as to how external manifestations of genders are supposed to be in the sense, uh, what pronouns that you use. If you are a man, you are supposed to call yourself a he or he's or something of that sort. If you're a woman, you're supposed to call yourself she, her and everything. How you dress yourself, what kind of haircuts you have, how you behave, what is your voice, what are your body characteristics are all the matters of gender expressions, right? And society does to a larger extent again dictate that. Uh, just as a aspect there as an additional uh, information which most of you might be aware is that the word they has been declared by Merriam Webster's dictionary as the word of the year and this word they is used in fact as a pronoun for the person who do not identify themselves either as male or female right so if I am a person who is uh, gender fluid right then i should be referred as they so like when you say that uh, abhijit is this and he is that then you are not supposed to use the like, pronoun he you are supposed to, mm -hmm. to be saying that they are this right and that's the how pronouns are going to be accepted in the entire system 
but again of course you see that this is how how detached that we are from this because it's not something which is going to naturally be coming to all of us now in in the traditional sense of the term when we have studied genders under the entire uh, spectrum of gender studies uh, to a large extent we always believed in uh, binarism where there are only two genders and then those are the two ultimate water type compartments and either zeros or ones end of the story but the studies have shown subsequently that gender is actually fluid and that's why people need not necessarily fit into the same as uh, you know uh, aspects that the society essentially believes it to be and but nonetheless you know you find that this bullying in the uh, calling names and everything essentially starts from the ignorance that people do not understand that pe other people can be gender fluid right and then uh um, when we talk about the second part i mean the third part of the entire debate so after sex and gender we have to talk about sexuality we have to understand that sexuality is much broader a term than sexual orientation because sexual orientation is just your willingness to have sexual relationships with but sexuality is not just about sexual relations it is also about your sexual feelings thoughts attractions and uh, in general your uh, you know ideas of love and companionships are determined by your sexuality right so while we are looking at all of this factor we have to understand that every individual's sexuality is an important part and then you reflect on your days in the school or college as you see as to how much of the talks with your friends and your peers has primarily been about you know expressing your sexuality and then you think about a person who has been gay in that situation and who could not associate uh themselves with whatever that you were talking about and that is something which is going to be a problem when society when we say society has to accept it right then let's take the next part in the sexual uh, sexuality is is uh sexuality is nothing but how we see ourselves and how we physically relate to others right and it's uh, sexual orientation so to say is something which is referred to as person's emotional and romantic sexual attraction to individuals of a particular gender whether male or female now i as a man might have attraction towards females or towards males right but the accepted norm is i have to have it only towards females and if i just towards males then it's not considered right it's either considered as a disorder or in the terms of legal language of 200 377 of ipc it was unnatural but the question is was it actually unnatural or did we perceive it to be unnatural now the answers lie predominantly in the scientific ways of addressing things so scientific questions are these like whether it is a disorder or an unnatural aspect it's a scientific question the scientific answers are available which are clear that it is neither disorder and it is nor uh, unnatural right but again the acceptance of this part the scientific study is also a major problem so when we talk about sexuality i have to also talk about the fact that even as genders there are like almost some 58 different variations of genders which have been like identified and recognized you have multiple sexualities which are recognized again understand as gender is a spectrum so is sexuality so at an extreme end there is a person who is extremely uh, sexual and at the other end who is like very very sexually active but in between all of that there might be people who would have attractions to different different people so the usual normal heterosexual would simply mean a person who gets attracted to a person who's different uh, who has a different gender than themselves right so that's the point now with respect to lesbians and gays they feel attracted to the same gender with respect to bisexuals yeah. they feel attracted to both men and women with respect to people who identify as pansexuals they are attracted to the person as such and don't actually care about like gender like because bisexualism does not necessarily include uh, the ideas of uh, uh, being attracted to pan uh, transgenders or transsexuals and non confirmed gender non conforming people then pansexual is the label that essentially goes ahead with and to top it all to uh, you know bring it back all under one umbrella queer is the usually the term which is used to understand different sexualities so i hope you understand you know it's not so uh, you know straight forward so sexual orientation something which is to be known as a matter of scientific fact is that it's not a choice it's not a preference it's something what it's what exists as it is and naturally also you have to understand that it's not static over a period of time it might change you might uh, you know it's it's extremely fluid and um sexual orientation 
may not necessarily always be evident in the person's appearance or behavior. Not every gay guy out there is going to be effeminate, right? And if you presume that that is how the case is, then probably that presumption is based on uh, ignorance. So we have to probably understand that aspect as well. Thirdly, we have to, again, scientifically proven fact is uh, the fact that not every person who uh, has the attractions uh, towards the people of the same or the opposite sex would always elect to act on these feelings, right? So I might actually be, uh, you know, straight, but I wouldn't want to act as straight. Or I might be gay, but I wouldn't want to act as gay. And that is a choice which a person makes. And that's something which is a very, very personal factor uh, which exists. And then uh, most, uh, you know, of the people in the society essentially gives in trying to live a very, very heteronormative life uh, because of the societal pressure, right? Uh, and then you start to question as to whether all of these uh, alternate sexualities or additional sexualities, which are not heteronormative, sinful or immoral. And when we talk about sins, we are primarily relying heavily on the ideas of religion and how religion perceives what is right and wrong. And when we say immoral, we are looking at very, very norms based understanding, which are developed by the society. So very normative a question. And then, of course, uh, there is a lot of literature available on these issues, like how religions are supposed to look at homosexuality and everything of that sort. And normatively speaking, an ethical standpoint, how should we go about it? But I'm not going into the details of that either. But nonetheless, you have to know that there is this question which would always be there. So I have in the beginning did in fact mention the fact that, uh, you know, there is systemic heteronormativity, right? I would want to take some time to kind of talk about this and give only one instance in the lecture. And then there are, of course, multiple instances of systemic heteronormativity. But uh, I will just go ahead with one instance, probably. So when we're talking about systemic heteronormativity, you have to understand that um, systemic heteronormativity is uh, reflected in a system which believes that homosexuality, heterosexuality is default, right? That means you and I being straight is the default a society which accepts heterosexuality as normal. And uh, everything around in the systems are designed on this very presumption that everybody in the society is straight, right? Now, I'll just give an analogy probably uh, to understand this point. Uh, when we construct the buildings, your schools and colleges or malls and everything, when they are constructed, every architectural construction is primarily looked, uh, takes care of the people who are the normal ones. That means usually considered as able-bodied, right? So constructing a ramp for a person in wheelchair is always to a larger extent an afterthought, right? And it is this factor that you have to understand as to how systemic heteronormativity works. So everything that you would do for uh, LGB community is always going to be an afterthought and what is the presumption is this heteronormativity in all of our minds and that's the point that probably we have to consider. Can we build our buses, our local stations, our trains and everything keeping in mind you know people who are physically disabled and that creates the difference of accessibility right and that the same logic applies of course to uh, homosexuality as well. Then let's come to the part where uh, every system is designed in such a way which systematically undermine the concerns of homosexuals and at the same time enforces heteronormativity. So systems are made in such a way that there is this circle. Once you are presumed to be heterosexual, you would always have to act as heterosexual in every walk of life. And that is the way in which the society enforces all of this. Now, let me just give you a very idea about this. In my family law uh, classes, usually this question does come about uh, while we talk about marriages, because family law one is an issue about like marriages and how they are legally regulated. But um, the basic point that I'm trying to make is the very idea of marriage in the existing laws is essentially heteronormative. Right? There has to be a man and a woman who would get married. And anybody else other than that, even if they have romantic sexual relationships or love relationships, they are usually not considered, you know, like the marriage of, uh, or their union may might not necessarily be considered as uh, a valid marriage, so to say. 
But then before we talk about all of this, we have to ask this question to ourselves. Why do we in the first place marry? Right? What are the reasons for society to tell you? If you are a Hindu, probably marriage is one of the 16 sanskaras that you are expected to do in your life. Right? So religion also tells you that, okay, yes, you are supposed to get married. And then um, you have uh, certain things which flow from marriage. The first aspect is it gives, le it, it legitimizes sex, right? So sexual relationships between two people are legitimized. Again, this is based on a very simple presumption that everybody is supposed to engage into sexual relationships only after marriage. And so-called they're supposed to save themselves for marriage. Uh, but um, again, you kind of see in the present social context in the age of Tinder and Bumble, probably that kind of a presumption is ill-founded. So nonetheless, I don't think that, you know, uh, marriage legitimizes sex. It legitimizes only in the eyes of the society, but that does not necessarily mean that the people are not engaging into the acts of sex before uh, marriage. Second uh, reason why probably we have, uh, we, we marry is because we want to legitimize the children which are born mm -hmm. out of this wedlock, mm -hmm. right? And the very idea that every marriage as a union is for the purposes of progress and growth and sustenance of uh, and continuation of human race is based on the very idea of uh, procreation, right? And marriage legitimizes this entire procreation. But again, is that an all-round idea or understanding of marriage and probably not because you know naturally speaking there are many men and women who are infertile right and for whatever reasons and probably the reason why you have all of these other factors coming in like you know IVFs or um, uh, artificial inseminations or uh, you know what you have other uh, factors which are the uh, surrogacy all of these right but procreation if you consider marriage is to be founded only on the idea of procreation, then probably the infertile couples are not supposed to be, you know, their marriages are not supposed to be considered valid, but that's not the case. But again, you see, the society and religion helps you build these things. I mean, I will give you an example again from Hinduism, where a person, if they do not have issues or offsprings or have do not have kids, are not allowed to take part in certain pujas or certain rituals. And then you see as to how society even discriminates against these. And is this natural? I mean, like, why would religion want to discriminate against this should be the question that you and I should definitely ask if we are thinking beings. And the last part, which I want to talk about, like, why we marry is probably we want to have family, you know, a support group is probably we want to have companionship to spend our life with, which results in creation of a support system. But then if we consider marriage as family, companionship and a support system, does that necessarily mean that marriage have to be in that sense heteronormative? Okay. Of course not, right? Like, so in this case, we have to understand if the idea is family, companionship and support system, the heteronormative idea of marriage just does not probably be the sole outcome, right? And then uh, if you would have watched this Indian matchmaking on Netflix, I'm not sure how many of you did, but if you would have watched it, we have to understand this entire idea of you know, where the hell is love in this picture? Oh. Like, why are we talking about marriages as if some political union, some professional union, uh, so the son of the lawyer gets married to the daughter of a judge, probably to, you know, like whatever. And then uh, politicians marrying with, within the families, uh, business people marry families. All of this has absolutely, is this like an arrangement? It's not something to do with love. And then we kind of seem to have undermined the very significance of love. We are a community which is celebrated. I mean, Hindus essentially are celebrated the love relationships between Radha and Krishna. But in real life, in society, love is, is a problem. So you have like love jihad, you have so many other things. And then uh, honor killings, God knows what all. And then so many things are not accepted. And I am talking about, again, not the uneducated, ignorant. And I'm talking about educated, willful, ignorant people, right? In the sense where they know that love can happen between anybody, irrespective of their religion, their financial background, whatever the case might be. But seemingly, our castes are so important, our religions are so important that love takes a second seat. Wow. And then I am not sure as to whether marriage as an institution has anything to do with the very idea of love. And then the question that you and I should probably ask, should marriage be based on all of these social considerations or should it essentially be based on love?
And if it is to be based on love, then should it have to be in that sense of the term, heteronormative? And then the questions are, are of course, many. And based on this marriage itself, that you know, you kind of see certain factors flow, as in the very idea of family. There is a very interesting movie on uh, Netflix titled um, Fathers. It's a Thai movie, and then you probably should watch it, where two fathers are, are uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, a gay couple has a son, and what all it goes through. And that's something is, uh, what all the couple goes through is something which is very, very interesting to look at. Secondly, you also probably have to kind of look at the factor which flows from the family is parenthood. So our roles of father and mother are so gendered that uh, that, that homosexuality just does not figure into the entire uh, narration, uh, entire narrative. So let's take the simple example where if I am a person who is married to a woman and I want to be a stay-at-home dad, people would essentially be the first question. In the sense, like I know my wife is probably earning more than me, so let her go and do her work. I would just be home and take care because rearing of the children need not necessarily always be mother's job. It can also be done by the father. By excluding father from the entire picture, we are systematically or systemically reinforcing this heteronormativity and gendered roles of mother and father. And probably we have to question all of this. Can father not be loving? I mean, can mother not be strict? I don't know, like, I mean, it's, it's all an open question. And then we have to think for ourselves as to what is it that we are essentially going to be looking forward to? Is it the betterment of that child as to if the father is loving, let the father take care of the baby. And then, you know, like, let the mother go out and earn, and then whatever is fine is fine. And let people be is entire motto that probably, you know, underlines all of this. But the problem lies for hetero uh, homosexual community there also because there are adoption laws are made in such a way that they are tilting towards, of course, heteronormativity. Surrogacy laws, I mean, at least the proposed surrogacy uh, bill, essentially does talk to a larger extent about making sure that it is available only for heterosexual couples and not yeah. for homosexuals. So we have a lot of problems. So what did we do? Like if I have been talking about the problems till now, what are the solutions? I mean, what did we do till now? I mean, we have one in the judgment, like, you know, Nauti Singh Johar versus Union of India, very celebrated judgment uh, with respect to at least uh, homosexuals in this country. But what did the judgment do? The judgment only permitted consensual sexual relationships between the adults of the same sex, right? Mm. But the judgment does not talk about any issue which is uh, planning on addressing this systemic heteronormativity. Right? Because at the end of the day, the two days, uh, like I guess two days before you might have come across this news of a boy from Calcutta essentially making this claim that the police uh, officials have sexually assaulted him because of the way he was walking and, uh, and then they picked him up from the streets of Calcutta and then like, you know, put him um, in, in jail for a time and then in their custody and then uh, did whatever they did with him. So if the judgment was passed, why isn't it then reflected in the society? Is the change of the judgment visible? And to a larger extent, the answer, of course, is no. Mm-hmm. One of the things which would did uh, in the judgment was the court said that media should take up a role of promotion of uh, or normalizing uh, homosexuality or homosexual relationships in the society. So after the judgment, you kind of had only two movies which did talk about these issues, which were mainstream movies. Is like I guess ek ladki ko dekha to aisa laga. Another one was Shubham Mangal Zyada Savdhan, but other than these movies, which are the movies which are seriously addressing the concerns of this? I mean, Dostana was just a fun uh, yeah. approach where people were pretending to be gay when they weren't. And that's definitely not the correct portrayal of gay community. Uh, even, uh, you know, uh, the show of Karan Chohar, which is there again on Netflix about like uh, finding a match for other person. So like finding love was the issue there. And then there is this one uh, homosexual character there. And then you see as to how people and the system also could not understand the concerns of that person to make sure that he has the dates which the person would like to be made available to him. And that's a very, you know, crazy situation to live in. I mean, the changes are not at all visible. You only permitted sex. That does not mean that homosexual relationships are just about the sex. And that's the reason, again, why through 
the built up for us frustration that i chose the topic as to it's about love it's not about sex at all sex is part of way of expressing love but i hope that you know we we do realize uh, this uh, very factor so what is it that we are supposed to do in this entire picture so we have so many changes to make we have so many questions to ask after asking the questions we have so many changes to make we have so many lives to save the lot of sexual minorities are suffering they are dying just because they cannot accept themselves let me just tell you one simple thing for every gay person in india who know that they are gay whether there is self acceptance or not they are only they are uh, there are only three choices which are available to them the first choice is an extreme one and of course i would refrain from mentioning it here the remaining two choices are either to succumb to the pressure of the society family and peers and constantly pretend to live up to their heteronormative expectations have a family have a wife have kids and constantly try to suppress this sexuality of yourself which is an integral part of your personality and it is what you are knowing full well that it's not going to go anywhere even if you pretend but your whole life is a stage and it's a drama that you pretend that you know you are a heterosexual because society expects you to do that i mean you can see how frustrating can that possibly get or the second solution is you stand up for yourself and choose not to be you know uh, subscribe to these heteronormative expectations be what you are and be proud but even when this seems to be a wise choice to make this choice of course isn't easy it has its own set of challenges society may have severely harsh reactions with your ways of living right problems in housing and lot other factors you may have to face many challenges in every walk of your life professionally personally uh, everywhere yeah. you might have to face the challenge of being disowned by your own family by which you lose the support system structure that was existent there right you also have to carry this burden throughout your life of not being able to live up to the expectations of your parents and family right i mean like i said you love your parents but then when you have that factor that you know you have disappointed in them it's it's a big feeling that you probably have to kind of live up to and so you have this solution and now in both of these situations either you choose to succumb to expectations or stand up to expectations your life is not going to be easy now when the life is not going to be easy what should the gay community do and that's the essential question that you know we have to address it all and let me tell you all of us have someone in our families in our peer groups in our friends or something of that sort who are suffering through this suppression and oppression but are never willing to talk about it primarily for the reason that somewhere down the line we did not make them feel comfortable enough to talk about it so it's our shared responsibility now to ensure that every human life is valued no matter what and that every human right of every one is protected so what we all can do of course is to educate ourselves and not use education only as a means to you know instrument of earning money no education in true sense of the term which is life changing self discovering opinion formation ability to think critically that kind of education and then learn to accept and respect people for who they are and that's the very essence of like respecting lives of people so i guess i had this to talk about a lot can be said because it's the entire duration long semester course but i think i have given a basic idea and made you think in a very very human way oh. to the problems of lgbt community uh um, of course there are many problems within the community also probably that might take another time for us to discuss but nonetheless we have focused on how society should learn to accept this next step in the fight for lgbt community in india is is marriage equality presently the petition is pending before one of the high courts in the country hopefully that courts would do something and uh, i am not sure if the legislature would be willing to do something because probably for legislature to act on certain things what is required is 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 a sizable number of uh, pressure uh, from a group and economic interest for the people involved 
so maybe it's going to be very difficult for us to expect that from legislature but see me saying that also is very very frustrating because it's it's actually bad if our leaders are not able to understand the plight of our people um but nonetheless judiciary seems to be the recourse in the present context so hopefully that judiciary will try to do some things but without uh, i'm not going to stop unless until i say this once again that we all have the role to play in accepting everyone for who they are so thank you thank you so much for listening patiently to all what i had to say so if you have any questions uh, you can uh, please ask them in the chat Uh, okay yeah there are i guess a few questions which says though apex court has decriminalized same sex uh, relation in 377 of ipc it will have no effect unless society's mindset is changed absolutely i mean i have said this like you know unless and until society changes it's definitely not going to change i mean like i said we have i mean i'll give another example from uh, law background which is you have a uh, dowry prohibition act right and then taking and giving of dowry is criminalized <laughs> i mean the law is there from like 1960s but still because the society did never accept this as law the law is not a success so you may have the law which is good but unless and until society subscribes to that idea it's absolutely uh, you know going to be an utter failure so society has to kind of accept this and society has to probably do away with lot of this clutches of religion uh, and uh, probably even sometimes thinking about uh, you know like a, a very very uh, un uniform ideas of living life so regimentation and everything of that sort so probably all of this have to go like you know you have to look at it from a cultural relativist point of view probably another question says that after 377 verdict do you think that there is any change in the acceptance of homosexuals or the way as uh, society views them no i mean like honestly speaking there hasn't been much of a change so to say i mean uh, uh we have to again understand that you know we have different different layers well within the society so you you kind of have um, you know on the top of it all uh, individuals accepting themselves so there might be some change there because they think that now law favors them but but that's the only change which might possibly be there but nonetheless unless log kya kahenge that attitude doesn't go and what log kya kahenge is still a consideration to a large extent uh, we would still be uh, not achieving what we were supposed to another question is your views on if two persons of same sex are in legal relationship uh, what about their personal properties after death of one of them if he or she does uh, dies in testate okay so again you have to understand like i said like most of the family laws that we have are primarily based on heteronormativity as a norm uh, the use of the language uh, also in the legislation says husband and wife they are not <laughs> gender neutral terms as partners or spouses right. and uh, yeah. when 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 you have like you know let, let's say under uh, uh, hindu succession act or indian succession act the categories is husband and wife and everything of that sort uh, unless <laughs> until law recognizes two people as husbands or two girls as wives together uh, it's it's not going to change um, any time soon so probably we need to make like like i said the systemic heteronormativity reinforces the entire constructions about uh, you know this this narrative of uh, heteronormativity of the society so we have to do make all of these changes i mean the basic things as is like when i go to the hospital would my partner get to know or would he be the person who would be contacted by the hospital without asking questions as to what is my relationship with the person and if the questions get asked as to what is my relationship what should i tell is he my husband or is he my friend or whatever and you see like in every bits and pieces that you know gay couples have to kind of like fight for their right and uh, uh, something which i have to probably add again in, in the context itself is the fact that coming out is is a major major uh, life changing event considered in like a gay person's life i mean for all uh, big, and then coming out is primarily because the society believes that you are heterosexual and then now you have to tell them that you aren't and that's why you have to come out and you can see how coming out can be an absolutely frustrating irritating burdensome uh, uh thought process i mean it's not easy to like kind of go ahead and tell people that this is what it is because of the fear of being judged ruining the expectations and lot of other factors 
So we have to kind of look at this even coming out as the entire process. So um, would it not just be possible that, you know, like you simply go ahead and tell your parents that you love this person and irrespective of the gender of that person, your parents just simply accept it. I mean, that's an ideal situation in an Indian context. We're riddled with like casteism, religious ideas and everything of that sort with honor killing and intercaste marriages and interreligious marriages being opposed. It's a very, very long shot, but hopefully that, you know, at least the generation which seems to be accepting of all of these would probably be that, um, you know, inclusive. Uh, then I would like to, uh, the, the, another question is, um, we know that gender is fluid, but is the sexuality fluid as well? And the answer is yes. Sexuality, scientifically speaking, has also been considered to be fluid. Over the period of time, it's presumed sometimes also that the sexuality of a person does change. And um, fluidity also means that, uh, you know, uh, not just like, you know, once you decided that you are homosexual, uh, that you might not necessarily would want to change the label for yourself based on your experiences. I mean, uh, again, I'm talking in terms of Indian society where sexual, sex, sex education is not the part of the school curriculum and we all have to find it out behind the closed doors or in the uninformed group of peers. But at the same time, we have to understand that unless and until we have the sexual experiences, we would definitely not know what we are. And in a society where sex is taboo, getting all of these experiences is also equally difficult. So I don't know how people are going to deal with it. Some of them would take an absolute objection as to like, we do not want our people to be like, you know, sexually uh, just uh, engaging into a lot of activities, but they might not necessarily tell it to your parents, but we all know that sex does happen in Indian society. I mean, like look at the quantum of population anyway, or the profiles that you visit on Tinder or, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Bumble or whatever the case might be, but reality is something which is completely different. So, um, so yes, the sexuality is fluid. And um, for the acceptance in society, what initiative can a law student take? So first and foremost is, uh, like I said, you first accept, um, you yourself have to be convinced with the fact that you accept everybody else, no matter what, right? That's the first stage. And once that stage is reached, then you can start, you know, creating smaller groups, like many IITs in the country, or even like National Law School Bangalore has these, um, you know, gender studies groups where these people come together, they screen movies, they talk about the issues. Uh, when I was in the law school, we did in fact even like participate in the protest against uh, the Supreme Court judgment, which came on 11, 12, 13, uh, I mean, 11 December, 2013 about, uh, you know, like which uh, un overruled the decision of the Delhi High Court in Nas Foundation. So you have to be socially active. Like, I mean, that's some, something which can definitely be done by you. Associate yourself with the, you know, uh, people, who are of alternate sexualities, organizations which work for alternate sexualities, because problems are many. And then as much help as the community can get, the community should in fact receive it. So if in any capacity whatsoever, sometimes even as simple as lending a comforting ear to your friend in need is, is more than what you can possibly do to sometimes even save lives of the people from you know, killing themselves or committing suicides. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. So make sure that you allow communication. You always, you know, conduct yourself in such a way that you probably uh, show that you are accepting of it all and also willingly accept it all so that people feel comfortable around you. And subsequently you take it to the stages higher, create a group in this university or in your college, then subsequently go out meet organizations, work with them. And then of course, you know, carry out the research, so many factors. So you have a thousand other things to do. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I guess those are the questions. Are there any other questions? Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. So there's one more question. There which is one more question that says, does same-sex love or homosexuality changes the dynamics of nature? Oh, that's usually the question. <laughs> I mean, um, the lot of people, I mean, like anti-gay movements kind of did in fact to a larger extent relied on the concept of natural selection. So to say, where like, you know, those who are gays are probably eliminated out of the entire picture. But if, if, if just because, you know, procreation is the sole aim of, of human life, then I think again, we are, you know, creating a problem for ourselves in our understanding of valuing human life in itself, just because a person 
cannot procreate or sometimes willingly do not want to procreate does not necessarily mean that our human entire race is going to be in problem because just as there would be people who would want to not have kids there would be people who would want to have kids and um, one of the studies in the us at least has shown after uh, the you know obama administration has undertaken a lot of um, pro lgbt uh, initiatives uh, of course uh, now the situation is probably different uh, it in, in fact in did shown that um, the gay parents are 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 way more uh, you know open in terms of addressing the issues of their kids as opposed to that of uh, probably uh, you know like the heterosexual couples and that's again primarily because what i have been taught in my life is what i would tell my kids because it's the cycle of life which constantly goes so you receive your sanskars from your parents your sanskars will then subsequently go down to your children and all what you have witnessed and uh, faced in your life would subsequently probably change your uh, uh, you know uh, view point and that's the reason why what is important is exposing ourselves to all of this simple thing as like you know participating as an ally in gay pride parades which happen in your respective cities like in mumbai it happens in january usually so you you know you might want to like participate those like showing and making a political statement that you support gay community you are exposed to uh, what the culture is and that is something which is a very very important factor so i think we all need to do a lot of uh, uh, you know self realization use education for our own betterment and helping others so yeah that's about it yeah thank you so much sir i think that uh, these are the questions we don't have any more question in the chat box uh, so i would just uh, you know sum up by saying wow what a session sir it was really thought provoking very very thought provoking and i wish you know more people could hear you say that you know yeah. i could actually as a participant feel you know whatever you were saying you know uh, as you said about the feelings of uh, these homosexual community then how you know it is always that the people are associating them with sex and not with love you know not with companionship so very appropriately sir you have put in you know the things as you know any insensitive person who would have heard your uh, speech today or you know he would have started thinking about it seriously sir because we live in a community where you know people don't accept them as you very rightly said you know educated in uh, you know ignorant people they just don't want to accept it sir thank you so much sir for the wonderful things that you said you know that how there are reasons of or the problems for accepting them why majorly because there is an ignorance i mean either they don't know or they don't want to know and then you know even if they know 377 and laws like that has made it so difficult that it is criminal so something which is criminal you should never accept you know and we do understand the you know like any other uh, uh, agitation that goes on in the country this is also one of the uh, kind of a i would say revolution where these people are trying to find an identity or an acceptance sir. Mm-hmm. so the uh, you know that uh, topic of the session was so appropriately put by you it's all about accepting these people sir it's not about that people don't understand it's that we don't accept them and i think you know whatever you have said you know if any sensitive man doesn't matter educated or uneducated but any sensitive man if he hears it you know and he feels for it you know as you very rightly said in animals these things are there but it is we yeah. human beings we make it so damn difficult that we are in a very straight jacket formula is there for life you cannot deviate otherwise you are pervert so this is the thing which is there absolutely with every sect naturally and so much from your heart that we could it actually went into our hearts and we could really understand sir on behalf of hsnc board sir and ari gusani law college a very big thank you to you sir for bringing us and awareing the ignorant people educated ignorant people about knowing all these things and you know uh, this is all a quest of making people to accept things and become more sensitive towards such issues like we are very sensitive towards the gender issues about the caste issues and stuff but we don't want to be sensitized towards this issue so i think you know sir you have done a brilliant job in bringing all these things together to us from various perspective and we feel honored to be you know at least uh, hearing you on this topic 
thank you so much sir and i'm sure all the participants you know if not they would start looking at it from a different perspective and the word acceptance has to come into our lives you know we need to accept like we accept every other thing we need to accept this so that the society can flourish together with every kind of people living in this world thank you so much sir and uh, because there are uh, no other uh, questions but yes people are uh, putting up their feedbacks uh, thank you for the feedbacks um, sir i would uh, now wish to wind up the session uh, and invite my principal if she want to uh, say something on this before we end the session for the day ma'am uh, yeah samvita you have given proposed such a wonderful vote of thanks that i don't think there is anything more i can add but when i was listening to professor rohi i realized one thing that when a teacher i'm not saying he she or they i'm saying when a teacher takes a task as an assignment he becomes monotonous but when he is passionate about that topic then the best in him comes out and you have succeeded abhijit in putting us in the shoes of the sexual minority i recall that when i started the welcome address i did say that no community however small should be deprived of its sexual uh, right and uh, expression of these rights otherwise they tend to lose their dignity and their identity i made a statement but you know when you started your session and you started from the school you know how the child is bullied and then how the parents may not support i really could understand the impact of that word of identity and dignity you were simply brilliant you know that's why I, like i could you know easily understand how a sexual minority person could feel about these issues coming to your knowledge on family law brilliant i had heard you at mnlu on jurisprudence you had given a demo lecture when i was a member of the committee and when i came back to my college i told my professor look this is the way professor rohi approaches the schools of law and he can link it to amartya sen but now i see that you are equally efficient in teaching a subject like family law now please be prepared i am going to invite you again for a session on family law and you are sure. very right you know the very purpose of marriage is depicted as procreation whereas it is never love companionship and respect maybe that is the reason why the marriages of the younger generation are going on the rocks today and the marriages of the elderly people let, let's say like my generation many may be not marriages they may be just a case of as you would say uh, adjustments and accommodations you know so we need you have given a lot of food for thought which we have to reflect but i would like to inform the audience here if all of you could read a book on origin of uh, private property family no origin of family private property and state by frederick engel he was the best friend of karl marx and you will realize how this family came into the picture you know it's an eye opener so it was a wonderful session that we have had with you and i don't think it's only 1% you said 1% also feels that way i'm sure many of us really will try to understand this issue and we will start accepting one more thing by the way though women have a right you know and we enjoy wearing all colors i deliberately decided to wear a blue today okay <laughs> because normally it is pink for the woman and blue and i do see professor rohi in a blue shirt you know so <laughs> i decided i deliberately wear a blue let people think what they like you know yes. i'm not saying we we have to be like the sexual minorities but let us learn to respect what they are and we go a step beyond that by really accepting them because after what you have said we can really empathize we can put ourselves in their shoes and understand what they are going so let us learn to accept and professor rohi thank you very very much for the excellent session that you have given us but i'm going to invite you for family law too
Sure, thank sure. You. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you to the wonderful team from HR, which has uh, given us the technical support and done the recording. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, just one uh, instruction to the participants, I put in the feedback uh, link over there. Need all the participants to give their valuable feedback to us so that we can look into it and you know, we can have such sessions more also in future, which we are already planning to have more such sessions because I believe that having such sessions once will not be sufficient. We need a lot of awareness. We need people like uh, Abhijit Rohi to be talking on this thing and sensitizing people. So thank you so much sir uh, with the promise that we are going to get back to you for more such sessions or as ma'am said for the lectures thank you sir so i thank everyone i thank the participants i thank my technical team of uh, shubham harsh uh, you know who are handling all these technical things for the today's session i thank all the participants for the patient hearing and listening and uh, participating by putting your questions we now wind up with this session uh, with the hope that soon we'll be coming up with another such session thank you all thank you sir thank you thank Bye. you abhiji thank, thank you, you. Uh, Shubham, you can just wind up the meet. Oh, okay, ma'am, sure. Thank you.